Okay. All right. Welcome, everybody. I am here with Beth, who wrote The Human Herd, and we've been talking about this book for a while, and I'm just so excited and grateful to be talking to you, Beth. So thank you for talking to us, and I will let you introduce your wonderful self. <laughs> uh, thank you, Julie. Thank you for having me on your podcast. Um, so I am Beth Ann Standig, and I am um, a... a therapist, a leadership and culture consultant. I work with individuals and families and groups in the capacity of doing some therapy, but most of the work that I do now is with people around workplace relationships and mm -hmm. helping work teams and also larger organizational projects so that people can uh, design and train and really get their workplace groups up and running with a culture that leads to more health and has a mental health focus. And I'm a writer and <laughs> um, my background's in poetry, um, but I, I do a lot of different kinds of writing. And I wrote the book, The Human Herd, based on the model that I use in working with people. And um, that's called natural leadership. And I incorporate in my work with people all of the phenomena and concepts and skills that I've learned with my animals. And, um, and I integrate human psychology with mammal life in a way that helps people think of themselves and how they take care of themselves and their relationships a little differently. And sometimes I find actually more it's a, a simpler approach than the sophisticated <laughs> ways that humans can yeah. sometimes complicate. complicate things yes yeah. exactly yeah so yeah, yeah for sure well I mean I just I loved your book I think it has so many applications my group as you know um is dog handlers and yes. most of us are out there competing in all different types of venues and taking our dogs and driving around and all of this kind of stuff and are, are very serious and competitive about it and just want to always figure out how we can get better, how we can get better. Right. And from the opening introduction, I guess, where you talk about settling in, I just thought that was a great place to start, not only because you started the book there, um, but also just because we're always asking our dogs to go to different places and, and perform as if they were at home or perform in these different places. And the, the whole concept of like settling in just like really hit me fast. And I'm even going to like fangirl for a second and read like a, a phrase because there was one little phrase that, I mean, there's a lot of phrases, but there's one phrase that got me in particular with, that was the doorway bursts at the seams, not with people, but with pressure. Yeah. And I always think of like the energy of the places that we walk into and it's not just our own energy that we're bringing and how we can settle in, but like the, the, the energy of the building, the pressure of the building, the pressure of the competition and how that changes. So yeah, massive introduction, but just like jump Thank in you. wherever okay. that conversation okay. you want to start. Cause I think it's all really helpful for us. Thank you. So the concept of settling in and that term actually came from my daughter. And I, I tell the story of it in the introduction to the book to help people settle into the book. Mm -hmm. Um, but also to introduce a very primary, um, way that we take care of ourselves or don't take care of ourselves in the human world <laughs> and children and animals show us this. And my daughter, when she was about three going on four, um, explained this to me and put some words <laughs> to something that I'd been experiencing forever. And it was about transitioning into a new space and going to a fancy party and feeling as we walked into the room that we were transitioning from our little world, you know, had gone through the world in a car, gone into a new place. And it was this place full of people and she reacted to it appropriately and normally and you know, having a very authentic, unfiltered response, which was like, this is too much for me. I need a minute. And yeah. she said, I need a minute to settle in. And, um, and I, I was so grateful in that moment to be aware and present enough with myself to hear it and listen and, um, and ask myself, like, what is that? What's happening? Which is a really important question and how we settle in, like what's going mm -hmm. on with me right now in right. this space. 
And I got down at her level and looked around and felt it. And it was like, oh, this is the source of social anxiety right here. Like we're, <laughs> right. we could, because we <laughs> skip past the transition. Yeah. We don't allow just the mammal part of us that needs to orient and breathe and, and find like a, a place where our nervous system can, can resettle itself, which it will do if we give it the opportunity and instead we go in and we start talking and interacting and thinking and this whole part of us, this, this, you know, neural network and the body and all of the impact of stress hormones and chemicals is just, you know, going wild. It's just flooded and we're out there pretending to function. And I'm like, right. how often do we do this every day where yeah. we're transitioning from one thing to another and we don't give ourselves even a minute. It wasn't like we needed that's what I have found as I've been really studying this phenomenon of, of settling in and teaching it and practicing it, you get really efficient at it and you don't need mm -hmm. a long time, but we do need a minute to just look around and breathe before performing or right. relating or doing any kind of complex thinking or communicating. We, we actually just have to settle into ourselves in this space. So with the animals, I have found as a dog person myself, and, um, and I was saying earlier that I, I've been doing, um, sheep herding, mostly sheep herding, some agility, but mostly sheep herding for 30 years with my border collies. And mm -hmm. so I've taken them into all kinds of environments all over the country and, you know, clinics and competition and different training fields and and then just living with them and doing things with them sure. in the world also with my horses and then watching it with children. And I'm so grateful to the animals and kids for being so open and honest about how they experience pressure in the world when we don't give them a chance to settle in Yeah, so that I could see it and then try to communicate to humans, like, let's step back and look at this as a, an essential need. Cause that's really what so we're talking it, about. It's not a luxury. It's an essential need. Right. So your daughter, it sounds like kind of gave you the vocabulary. Yes. Like you knew it in your body, but you didn't have the vocabulary yeah. around it. And so then, but then how did you link that to like observation of your animals or did you already, were you already doing that naturally? And again, you just needed the vocabulary. Like how did it was that a little bit of both? Okay. I think it was a little bit of both. Like, I think I was doing it. I've always listened to my animals and look to them. Like, rather than thinking of like, how can I help them? I start with like, what's happening with us. So I'm, okay. I'm on an equal playing field. When we go into a new space, for instance, how are we like, how am I, how are you, how are we and what's going on around us? So okay. I'm not the guide. I mean, I will step in, I love it. Leadership, but like, they're going to give me feedback about the world that I'm not seeing because we're a herd or we're a pack. And so right. I'm not dominant in, in the, in terms of awareness and communication of needs. I might play a leadership role at times and I'm committed to being an awareness leader with, with them but they're going to give me information that I don't have. So I value their feedback about what they're experiencing just as much as I value my own. Wow. So I think I've that's so powerful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's so powerful. It's a gift that you naturally do that. But I think that, you know, so often as, he, as the human species, we feel the obligation maybe or pressure to be in charge, have all the answers, you know, know the thing, do the thing, you know, and do that. And I, I, the way you're phrasing it, it's like, yes, you step into leadership, but you're a partner and you're on equal footing. And I don't think that we think about that. Like, I, I just think, right. we think we're obligated or like, we should, all these shoulds, we should know, we should be able to do this. We should be able to handle all this or whatever. And I just don't think that we give ourselves permission to not know or to be equal or to be like, oof, like, I don't, I don't know what's happening. Like, tell me, give me something. Well, the thinking brain and living in many generations of like hierarchical, you know, hierarchical world where we've been 
implicitly or explicitly taught that we are smarter than animals because we have a thinking brain puts us in a position where we unconsciously act that way with them. What's interesting is that when we're missing all these signals of what's actually going on, the animal is, it doesn't, they don't trust Mm. us as leaders because we're Mm. not actually showing up in as good pack members. So we're sitting there thinking that we know best and we're in charge. And they're thinking, why is this person missing all these signals of what's going on and not taking care of themselves, me or us? And so if you look at like, why are animals not accepting our leadership? It's because it's got a major flaw and it's thinking that we're better than, and therefore we know, like we, we've got the whole situation handled, but this overemphasis on just the thinking brain and it has basically we've got all these blind spots that the animals don't right. have there and so if we can listen to them and listen to their feedback it's incredible how quickly they want to join up with us and partner and they see us as a viable pack member so if you just thought about it as like another dog for instance and we'll talk about it a lot okay. in, in, with dogs cuz that's your listenership and sure. your lens yep but if there was a member of the pack that was not picking up on legitimate cues within the pack of what was needed. Like, let's say it's like thundering and the dog and, and this one animal is just out there like running around and there's like lightning going on and there's hail and the rest of the pack is starting to hunker down. And this one member is just gone rogue. That Mm -hmm. pack would start to be concerned that that there's something wrong with that member because they're not taking the cues of the others that like the environment has told us that we should take shelter and you're not doing that. And so I'm not sure I can trust you. And ultimately if they kept doing things like that, they would probably reject that member because it's not safe. Yeah. And that I'm thinking of like all the anxiety from the animal that has to come up when you're like, kind of stuck in this environment. Yeah. I mean, I don't want to say stuck with yes. your handler who's who's not taking the cues. No, that's what it is. In a sense, they're sort of stuck with this person, this woman who's like not getting it. Yeah. And like, wow, then now I'm... they feel like they're unsafe or they feel like they can't trust or whatever, whatever. I mean, that's that we have all this, we have all these like behavior in dogs, right? Again, yeah. that we're trying to like control or change or whatever from the outside. Right. And with these older methods and and it's just amazing that like, hmm, perhaps the source is. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's root causes of what their behavior is a signal. It's trying to tell us that something needs adjusting and we're not listening to it. So right. the behavior escalates and because their survival, they're so committed to their survival that they're, they're not going to stuff the expression of needs, whereas we do as humans. And right. that's how we end right. up with stress disease because we're just stuffing the signaling of needs. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's so interesting because they, you know, we basically have this very, it's a dot, it's a dominance approach, which is really interesting because true dominance approach is about holding awareness. I will hold awareness so you can rest. Yeah. I will, I will hold space. So your nervous system can, can breathe and be at ease at ease. But what we're, we're saying, I'm dominant, but I'm going to miss all the cues (laughs) and I need you to accept me as dominant. And they're like, well, I can't. And then also do everything I ask you to do perfectly (laughs) and be an athlete. Right. Right. Like now, I mean, run really fast. (laughs) Yeah. Run really fast. Listen to all my cues, but I'm already not believing that your cues are viable and smart for me. And Yeah. So the anxiety is a core anxiety for them. It's they're worried about their survival and the, you know, the approach that natural leadership takes is that whatever signs and symptoms are coming up are our wise survival system, trying to tell us an actual need, an essential need. And if we can listen to it and attend to that need, then that sign and signal that, that symptom or that you know, behavior can quiet down. The nervous system can go back to a homeostasis. 
And so it's not that something's wrong. And that's another thing that we do. We're like, oh, what's wrong with my dog? Well, like, I was just also right thinking with your dog. Yeah, <laughs> your dog. Right. And I was just thinking of like, at this point, my listeners are like, oh my God, the guilt right now. Oh, they're all feeling like, oh my God, I'm not doing the right I thing. Know. I'm a bad mom. I'm a bad whatever. So like go there too. Like, how is that? Like, how do we not feel bad? Like how? Yeah. Cause or then we spiral, it, right? We want to yeah. do all the things like, oh my God, my dog has this problem. Oh my God, I'm the problem. Oh my God, now what? You know what I mean? I, I am the problem because I created it by not listening to my dog. And I mean, I've been in that boat with, as a parent, I've been in that boat as a horse person with my horses. Yeah. I've been in that boat with um, the dogs. You know, I just moved from California to Maine. And so I'm in this settling in process and I'm, I'm on a 900 acre farm. Oh my God. Like, that's just dreamy. Five miles from the coast. It's like a completely new land. And I moved here with my daughter. I'm with my partner and his five kids. And oh. then I moved my dogs and my horses. And so talk oh about God. settling in. Right. And I've noticed that you know, there's so much transition and so many moving parts that the settling in takes a while. And so just to that question around like the guilt or whatever shame that we feel like I've had to use my own settling in <laughs> concept and practice every day, all day since April. And wow. I've done it imperfectly where I'm like, yeah. And I'll step back. And I, you know, the, the magic question of kind of settling in is like slowing down and stopping and, and looking around enough so that you can ask yourself the question of what's happening right now. Yeah. And I've been sucked into this move process so that like, I'm busily doing things and then not asking the question and then find myself right. with a lot of holding a lot of pressure. And then that's really not been good for any myself or any of the mammals around anybody. Yeah. So it's right. happened a bunch of times since the move. And, you know, I don't, we can go into shame about it and like guilt or whatever, or just, I just, what I often say to myself when I notice that it's happened is like, well, thank goodness I'm noticing it now. Exactly. Correct. And, yeah. and this is like, we're this, how many generations of like, of human evolution have we gotten far enough away from really just taking care of ourselves as mammals, but being these sophisticated thinkers and intellectuals and, yeah. learn, you know, like how we have, we have many layers and generations of, of buying into thinking as right. the, like, right. that's, that's the thing that's going to solve all problems is human thought. And so I just try to like graciously look at, you know, in this moment, I'm very grateful that I do know how to listen to my mammal self. Mm -hmm. And so, and every time I am able to notice and attend to it, I'm learning, I'm, I'm reinforcing that as a new way. So it, I, and I think that that shame piece or that guilt piece it just, it's going to confuse the animals or other humans or children, you know? Yeah, for sure. More. Like they don't know. Right. It, it just it, doesn't do any good. No, it doesn't right? do any good. No, it doesn't do any good. I do think what is valuable though, is a little self-forgiveness, which Definitely. is, can be really hard. Yes. Um, but as we're going through the process to just, you know, you can't, you, you have to forgive yourself for the stuff you didn't know. Like if you, yeah. Once you know, then you can apply it. But if you don't know it, like you don't know you it, don't like know. how can you feel bad? I for know. That? And whenever I get a signal from like another, it, it is usually from the kids or animals, less so from adult humans, because we're just either they're numbed out in their own thinking process <laughs> yeah. or busyness, or they don't know how to signal and do, and give feedback in that human herd environment of like, hey, we're not right. okay. Let's just take a minute. We don't have great vocabulary or skills for that in our groups. Yeah. So I usually get the signals from myself, from the animals or from kids. And I, it, it, to get into that, like that more of a gracious mindset around it or self-forgiveness, I just try to go to gratitude where I'm like, thank you to the dog 
or the horse or the child. Thank you for telling me what and showing me that. And like, it also key it like it quiets the pride because I think the oh yeah, yeah the guilt yeah. part is about pride. It's about I my ego doesn't like that I was wrong. Yeah, or that I don't know the answer. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't like that I that I had to be told by the environment or someone else that something was needed. I want to just know, and so every time I can say like, thank you. And, and sometimes I'm sorry to myself and to us that I was not noticing that sooner. Like that, Mm -hmm. it, it just kind of quiets that inflamed pride piece, which like the Mm -hmm. ego needs some tempering. It's good for us to just be a mammal among mammals. Yeah. The word I got hooked on last year was curiosity, you know? And so And it speaks to your like asking why or asking or observing what's going on Yeah, just in that, like you just give yourself a moment not to have the answer and just be curious about what actually is happening, going on and just what are you observing or listening to? Right. Right. But I think that it's frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's then it's frustrating not knowing, or maybe not knowing how to read your dog. Like, how did you get to that point where you were reading the animals better? Like, did you ever like misread something and you thought it was this and it wasn't, or, you know, like, how do we get better at reading our dogs? Well, this part's where I, I I sometimes when I answer a question like this, I'm, I'm like, somebody's going to call me up and be like, you are simplifying (laughs) something way more complex than this. But like, I actually, I'm, I'm starting to wonder if I'm like, no, it really is this simple. Like the nervous system as complex as it is, is um, we're really just looking at like states of arousal. We're looking at like, how is it regulated or dysregulated and where on the scale is it? And if you think about it like that, and that homeostasis and a space of ease is this dynamic place in the middle where we're always kind of trying to, we're, we're adjusting ourselves all day, every day to try to be in a place where we're not overusing energy to, in order to survive. Yeah. And so if you just think about, and that's why I study pressure as a phenomenon, like not good or bad, but just, is there enough pressure that it's keeping your blood flow going and you're alive and functioning, but not so much that you're flooding your system and about to stroke out. Right. Right. Like, right. You don't want to like have no heartbeat, but you also don't want to be having aneurysms or heart attacks, right? right? Yes. So somewhere in the middle Preferably. of this <laughs> state of ease that I've learned in this like rest and digest state with horses where they're just grazing. Like they're just naturally flowing through the world and, and nothing's in the way of them taking care of their needs. They lay down if okay. they need to, they get up if they need to, they move if they need to, they're just attending to needs. And so- if we simplify that and instead of analyzing and putting a lot of names and labels on behavior and just look at it as like, where are you in the pressure continuum? What are you observing in your dog around energy? And does it look like it's dysregulated? Does it look like they're shut down or does it look like they're flooded or does it look like they're somewhere in the middle in a state of ease? Mm -hmm. And like, what, what does it feel like? in your nervous system. Cause you don't have to have studied. You can observe any mammal and your system knows how to read another yeah. nervous system. If right. Because that's be sort of expert. embedded in us. Yes. Yeah. And so instead of thinking that you don't know, this is where it's like, no, you do know. <laughs> like we, but we don't trust about, ourselves. We maybe. don't trust ourselves. We were just talking about all the ways that we don't know. Right. Yeah. Now we're talking about something that we actually do know. This is like a wise part of us that's totally intact that can read whether another mammal is at ease or not. Well, and it's so funny because we always kind of brag about, I guess, that the fact that how connected we are to our animals and 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 how we they they love us and how on all of this kind of stuff. And then, but all of a sudden there's this huge part of like their performance that we can't read. Like yeah. that doesn't make sense. Like it that literally is illogical. Yeah. It's yeah. illogical. Yeah. And so 
if you slow it down and this is, I'll just give you kind of an example of what it might look like with yes. a dog and a handler. So let's say like in your world, you've driven, you know, four hours to go to an, it's like a clinic or, you know, it's, it's a competition and it's bustling with energy. And like you've trained, you, you bustled with energy to, to get out of the house and get your animals mm -hmm. ready mm -hmm. and hurried to wait to be like locked up in a car yes. and then, yep. right. And, and then you've driven all this time and whatever stress that's caused and however much you've had to hold pressure in your body, then you get to the place and everyone else who's there went through the same thing to mm -hmm. get there. Mm -hmm. And yep. there's all this pressure about trying to get that event, whatever it is up and running. And there's mm -hmm. cross species mingling who yeah. don't know each other. So, right. so we're, we do not feel safe because we're not like, are these friends are the, and for the, the dogs and the people, our nervous system is evaluating life or death, friend or foe. Like, what am I about to be eaten? Is this safe? Like who, who is safe here? That is this a safe place? How do I get my needs met? Am I, how am I going to find safety? And who are my people? That's what mm -hmm. our system is designed to do when we go to a new place. And so then our dog starts like growling at others or putting its hackles up or lunging or barking or pulling at the, at the leash, you know, like some of the behaviors that you'll see, or they're super shut down and shaking and trembling and like, they won't move. Like you're trying to walk and they won't move or, right. you know, so they're like, they're, they're showing, they're exhibiting signs that something is out of balance. Yep. It's not wrong. It's out of balance. Something there's a need not being met. And right. so, and then we start to try to control it and shut it down. Yeah. yeah so yeah, if yeah. we were to just stop, just stop and imagine that you're watching the film of what's happening. <laughs> yeah. You're you and your dog are just, and you step back and literally step back, like get some scope, go to the edge of the system, the entrance and stop and observe and breathe. And you don't grab a hold of the leash. You hold it gently because it's a place like it's, it is like an umbilical cord between your nervous systems and you breathe and you just observe your dog, observe yourself, put less focus on what's going on with the dog, but like what's happening within me? How am mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. right now? What's happening with my dog? What do I see between us? How are we as a pack? And what's going on around us? You'll see immediately your pressure start to quiet and your animal every time. Yeah. And so it's the trying to shut it down that gets us into trouble and call it that like something's behaviorally wrong versus it's asking us to pay attention. It's this, that's what signals do. They're saying, Hey, right. there's a need. So right. ignoring it or shutting it down doesn't address the need. It's so interesting because I developed this, um, I call it a ritual and I try to teach it as a ritual. And the reason I use that word is because I need to protect it fiercely. Right. So that just felt like yes. you know, it's, it's beyond a habit. It just became something I needed to protect. Yes. And that is when I get to any new place, I leave the dogs in the car and I go get myself organized first, right? Because mm -hmm. I used to just me and the dog run into this brand new place. And both of us are like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Yeah. And so I was like, well, okay, that didn't work. And so all I did, I came to this by trial and error, but on some point I was listening and paying attention, right? To my dog and the results I was getting, right? I was probably more results focused, but at least I was experimenting with, well, how do I get us both comfortable. And so then from there, once I'm settled in, then we both go for a walk because we're both releasing some kinetic stored energy from, yeah. like you said, the drive or whatever. Yeah. And then I try to let my dog have a, you know, take them in the building of, or the environment and what they're going to see so that they can start to be like, Oh, this is what we're doing. Beautiful. And my first dog. And now one of my current dogs just would offer a down whenever they were yeah. done. And they yeah. would just lie down and yeah. they would look at me and they'd be like, I got it. 
And I'd be like, okay. And then I, my words are, I sort of release the pressure and I take them back out to the car and I let them settle in the car. Yeah. And so this is something I came up with and it goes on a little bit more in terms of how I then get them out and get them ready to walk into the ring. But I'm always preaching because that's such a soapbox for me of like coming up with a ritual that works yes. for our dog along with the fact that I really like to have my dogs crate in the car because I believe they settle and they actually sleep, even though they yeah. might be quiet and stuff in the, in the ring in a crate and they're behave quote behaving, whatever that looks like. I yeah. learned from my own dog. My first dog is first competition dog that, yeah, he was quiet, but he never slept he never settled yeah, by the right. end of the he, day. He was like vibrating yeah. because he just didn't know how to process the day, even though he was being this perfect little angel in a crate in the corner. Like I thought he was fine, he wasn't resting. but he wasn't fine. He wasn't yeah, resting he wasn't, at all. Yeah. We have to have rest and there's no way for yeah. the nervous system to rest in that environment. I mean, the, in your, in what you just described, that is a settling in ritual. And the only thing that I would add to it is making sure that you're, you're settling in and getting the lay of the land for yourself. There's still this like, um, agenda of like for my dogs. Yes. And so, yes. and this is like a handler piece because <laughs> so, it's like always for my dog or for my kid right. or for whoever, like yeah. the, my direct reports or whoever it is. Sure. Like, Cause we prioritize others. Yes. And what I would say is that your leadership and others' acceptance of it is completely dependent on you having a radical ritual of self. Mm. Like radical self-care mm. is about like, as a pack leader, I am going to be most trusted if what they see me do is radically take care of myself. And so I would go in and get the lay of the land until I had an internal down within me. Mm. Yeah. And then the walkabout is like, well, what it's not just about for the dog. It's like, what do we need? And so what are the rituals that I do? Like one of the things that I do is photography and, and it's very soothing for me. And I could go into that for a whole, like 15 minutes of why it's a good settling in practice and ritual for me because of all the different parts of myself that it reaches but even in that environment, I would take a while to go settle in, check in, look around, but then also like take even longer than I would think so that I can yeah. really deeply settle into myself and then add the dog and then make sure that it's like, I, I see their internal down, but do I have it yet? Cause sometimes yeah. we're, once you add the dog, we're in caregiver taking mode. Yes. Yeah. And I'm, like, oh my I'm God. just looking yeah. for you to lie down, but I haven't released yet. Right. I haven't lied down mentally yeah. yet. <laughs> yeah. And so like, and you can tell if you just check in with like the tension in your body, like, are yeah. you still gripping something? You know, are you still like, it, have you really, can you lay down when your dog lays down? Could you yeah. sit down with them? And if the answer is no, well, then the you're not settled in yet either. <laughs> Right. You're not. And the, the other thing that I think is it's bringing up for me personally is that like one of my dogs, when she walked into an environment not too long ago, she gave some of those like nervous signals, right? She started yeah. to yawn. She was like, you could see her go, uh oh, you know, you could see her start to get stressed. And immediately I went into the two things happened that I'm aware of, that I'm aware of, probably more happened, but that I'm aware of. Two things happened. One was, Internally, it was a trigger for me, small T trigger that I was like, oh shit. Oh no. She's doesn't like it. She's nervous. Oh my God. She's, you know, so I went into that reaction. And then the other part of me was the caretaker part. Like you just said, I was like, what can I do? What can I do? What can I do? Yeah. How do I quote, make her comfortable, make her happy, yeah. make yeah. her whatever. Oh my God. You know? And so there were those things, which are probably very intertwine. Uh, they're obviously intertwined, but like, I know, and this happened months ago, this wasn't even yesterday. And I can remember it vividly Yeah, uh, because I was like, I didn't know what to do. My mindset was, I don't know what to do for her. Yes. And that, and interestingly, that yeah, that pressure is what she feels from you, but she doesn't know any of the meaning that we're talking about behind the pressure right now. Yeah. So she just feels pressure coming from you. 
even though it's pressure to take care of her and all she can feel is pressure and something's wrong. Like there's a need, you have a need and she's going, well, what's our need? I don't know what the need is. Right. So that's where the we part. So it's how am I, how are you, how are we? Because if I'm over focused on you, yeah, I'm putting pressure on the relationship that's then going to impact your nervous system. And even in this moment, as you're talking through it, I'm thinking like, tell me what to do. Tell me what I, should <laughs> do. you know, we want it to be so prescriptive, right? We want it because we want so badly in our hearts to do the best the right for all thing. of our mammals, kids, yeah. horses, dogs, fish, whatever we want to do the best thing. And so I hear so many times from my clients and be like, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. I and then an they're answer. like, I'll do anything. I have an answer. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> They just want us to be. That's so hard. (laughs) I know. I know. Why is that so hard? I guess it's programming. Like, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of socialized self that's about like being performative and like, and, and achievement and trying and doing as a way of being worthy of relationship. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we don't do a lot of just being together. And I really realized, I mean, I, when I bought my ranch and I ended up, you know, building a herd of horses Mm -hmm. (laughs) for essentially what I didn't mean to, but I did. And, (laughs) And then I spent, and I also didn't mean to do this, but I spent a lot of time in between my daily activities going out with the herd. And it was how I settled into myself throughout the day, I would go and spend 10 minutes with them, 15 minutes, an hour, and just walk graze with them. It's just, they're just foraging together. Right. And sometimes they're playing and sometimes they're grooming and sometimes they're napping and sometimes they're eating. And sometimes they're, you know, there's, there's activities happening, but essentially they're, they're existing together and just caring about each other and themselves. And that's all anyone ever really wants from us. And so how do we bring that to that competitive morning? Well, I, I think that, you know, it's this, it's like, how can I go into this with a commitment to take care of myself? hmm to, so that my, and my dog and I, or my dogs and I can read signals from each other that we're going to care for each other. But I'm also going to go into that environment as a human who is there to offer that as well. And I think in a competitive environment, we see everybody as like the enemy because we want to win, <laughs> mm-hmm. but then we're not really ever in a state of ease. Cause we don't like, we might have people we're meeting there that are our friends, but like, you sure. really want to make sure that you've shown up somewhere where like, you've gotten some, there's, you've had some interactions where you feel safe enough relationally, like psychologically that you're that, that part of you can rest as well, where you're like, it's safe for me to just be if all shit were to go down, there's someone here that I feel safe with. Yeah. Interesting. And I've offered that too. I've been a friendly other to the other people here. I mean, at the end of the day, you're competing with dogs. I mean, it's not war, right? right? Right. It's okay. And these are usually people you've seen at other events. It's okay to be friendly and that it's your community. Right. So act like it, use it right? Like, Mm -hmm. do we actually settle into our community when we go to a dog show? Probably not. Hardly. Right. Yeah. But like that, it's supposed to be fun. Right. I I think (laughs) it's supposed to be fun. That's originally why we sent the check-in. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. I mean, yeah. And it's supposed to be like, how can we learn from each other and how can I have a good day? And I want to be able to just be and offer that to others. And you'd be amazed at what, of how valuable that is to others. Like yeah. I offer a space for people to come sit next to me and just be that that's enough. We're just right. going to be. And, and do you do that? Do you feel you do that through your energy or through your words? Both probably, both. but like, how do you my verbalize mind, that? I mean, it's yeah. like, I'm, I'm visualizing, like I'm, that's I, I, what I have to offer the world 
is to be a herd member or a pack member that is calm and alert and kind and trying to get along. I'm, I'm, my intent is to get along and Mm -hmm. I'm going to take care of myself and I'm going to do my best to, to listen to the needs of others. I'm just going to be like an attentive person in the world. And so that's my commitment Mm -hmm. and my mindset. And then when I notice my thoughts going otherwise, which, I mean, they can get really ugly about humanity, you know, you see sure. people behaving poorly and like, you can yep. get sucked into that, but I'm like, but that's mm-hmm. not why I, that's not my purpose. My purpose right. is to be an Island of something else to offer. Like that's the life raft I'm on. And so, yeah, then I'm, I'm, I'm like, how can I keep that going within myself? And if I notice I'm feeling irritated, aggravated, negative, then I need to take care of that so that I can continue to offer that to others. I want to feel that my, my level of, of stress is going to directly impact my health. So if I'm in a state of ease, that's good for me and it's good for others. And I will allow myself to that energy to go up if needed but I'm going to conserve it when it's not needed. So I love that. And one of the things that's coming to mind is that uh, like, so for most competitions, we are able to qualify or cue my business, but like, or cue um, without anybody else losing. Do you know what I mean? Like we all can get, like, we don't have to place or whatever. We can just qualify. We're working on our own goals. And so I always say there's enough green ribbons for everybody. Like yeah. there's, you know, there's enough to go around there. Um, and so a lot of times we're not really competing, but one of the all way too common and this blew Lizzie's brain, our mutual friend, this yeah. blew her brain, but every once in a while or too often, you'll get either unsolicited advice or people being like downright nasty oh, for yeah. whatever reason. And so there literally was someone I was talking to in a seminar recently who said she stopped competing because she doesn't want to go to these places. She wants to compete. She wants to take her dog. She wants to be in these environments. She wants to do this, but it's the other people. So how do you like wander into those places and be like radically self-care and take care of yourself, but then also you're putting yourself in an environment that could be icky. Yeah. I mean, I think it's your, there's people everywhere in the world that are going to have negative attitudes and be more competitive than they are collaborative. And, um, it's really good practice to learn like some, just some internal boundaries around, like not letting that get to us, not taking it personally, not getting pulled into it. And then looking for and developing relationships, like getting really good at, at, finding the people that are more like-minded with you and Mm -hmm. syncing up with them. And I mean, I can go into an environment like that. And now because of practicing this, it takes 10 minutes for me to find my people where I'm like, oh, you're the people that are here for the, to enjoy yourself. Yeah. And learn like you have an open mind and I'm like, I feel safer well, and I don't even feel like I have to go talk to them right away. No. I just need to know they're there. Exactly. So when I'm settling in, in a new environment, that's what I'm looking for. Energetically, I'm paying attention behaviorally. I don't, I don't have to go meet them either, but I'm like, oh, I can pick up on who's closed off. There's like a closed gate where you're like, this person has a lot going on internally pressure wise. And I'm not going near that because yep. that's not how I want to feel. Right. Right. And then picking up on like, oh, this is someone who is, is probably looking to have more ease in this experience and maybe more like-minded. And so I look for that everywhere I go as well. Our brain is doing it anyway, trying Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. identify sources of safety, others as a resource in case we need you know, that's just part of our survival is to go into an environment and very quickly try to find safe others. So well, it's interesting you say that because I always learned that it was about trying to identify the threats that that, that we're more threat focused than we are safety focused. It's both. Okay. 
All right. I mean, well, I don't, I mean, I, I love that it's more safety focused because being threat focused is too negative, but well, threat focused is safety focused, but we're look, it's, I mean, the way that I was taught around the neuroscience is friend or foe. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's both it, it's both. It. And. Okay. and so it's not one or Got the it. other. And our brain is scanning and looking for sources of threat, but it's also looking for in the same way that like, let's say the dog is chasing the cat. Like the, the cat is aware of the dog as a source of a threat, but it's also looking for a tree. Right, 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 right. Okay. Got and it. so we're looking for like, what is the source of pressure to move away from and where's the ease to run to? And yeah. so that we're just not used to thinking that way. So we're like very focused on the negative versus yeah, like, yeah, yeah. let me look for the places where I can breathe. Where right. is that? What's the place in the room that would feel right for my body to right. set up my, where do I want my chair? Who looks friendly? Who looks yeah. like they might be accepting? Like what other dogs look that way? Like that I might want to, like I will be in a dog environment or horse environment and I can very quickly think like, I'm, I'm going to go hang out near this group because mm-hmm. they're a little more regulated. Mm-hmm. And then if I look around, I'm like, wow, no one is, <laughs> yeah. what do I do? Because if I alienate us, that's not good. Like that's mm. going to cause its own signal. So I'm like, all right, well, which is the, the, the least dysregulated of the yeah. group? Where can I put Well, my, yeah, uh, it's interesting. Cause I've always been the like isolate person in that. I always think that when in doubt, it's better for my dogs to be like near the door or by themselves or off to the side than it is to be in an energy that I don't trust. Right. Right. Um, but but, but you're right. That sends another signal. It sends another signal. Right. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. What about like confidence? There's a, there's a big discussion of, um, in dog handlers about like, you know, developing, we, we talk about it again, like we're in charge, right? Like, like as if we could just wave a magic wand, which we can't, but like in developing confidence in our dogs. And I always try to remind people, like if they're not confident in the ring, they're not confident somewhere else too. It's not just in the ring, it's happening in other places. And I personally have this problem with one of my dogs who cannot perform the weave poles you know, we always joke in public, right? Cause she's <laughs> freaking brilliant, you know, in the backyard and in class and all of those places, but she cannot do it at a trial. And now it is this compounding thing, right? Yeah. Because now it triggers me. And now, there's right, that, right. Right, you know what I mean? Like now yeah. it just like compounded interest. Basically, she's like my person's stupid. out in the world saying that I can't do this. Just seeing right. <laughs> right. Right. And so, but I, and I know it's a confidence thing. I want her to enjoy myself. I'm, you know, I'm trying to do different things, but like, how do we do that? Like, how do we support Again, I know I'm coming from this place, so I'm already wrong in the question, but like coming from this place of like, I want to help fix it, which I know isn't perfect, but how do we get there? Yeah. Well, what, instead of thinking of it as something that's wrong, what do you think the need is? What is she needing? I think, I think it's confident. I definitely have identified that it's confidence and pressure, right? So when, some... that's a high pressure obstacle. Yes. And so she's sensitive to pressure. Yes. And so she needs experiences of being able to handle pressure in smaller doses Mm -hmm. so that she can learn that she can take on, like that she can learn to take care of herself around her her sensitivity of pressure rather than like stuffing it or that she needs to develop her own sense of, um, mastery of pressure, but it needs to be in smaller steps. So like, instead of, you know, how many weave pulls are there in the, I can't uh, 12. 12, yeah, 12, you start with like two or three, right. it's like smaller steps toward, you know, and doing it in places that are public, that are not maybe a trial, like starting to like okay. ease. It's like, what are the steps to take? to help her feel like she's having some success and takes some of it is about you. What are the steps that oh, I can take for where sure? I'm like, I know that we can do this because it's just three pulls 
And so, and I'm here to help support her in this so that she can feel more confident. And then looking for other places where you see her confidence shaky and looking for opportunities Mm -hmm. to help her celebrate herself and have successes where she is, but it's sensitivity to pressure that is the problem or not problem, but the source. Yeah. It's that, and it, and it's, it, I shouldn't have said problem. It's really like completely against the way my, my model and how I think it's actually her gift, but it's the fact oh, right, that right. the sensitivity, yeah, yeah, the sensitivity. And so it's, and for you and your mindset learning to like, this is going to be a good thing for her to have. We don't want it to go away. We want her to feel like she can take care of herself around pressure. Yes. Yeah. I love that perspective. Yeah. It's a complete shift, right? Yeah. Instead of like, how do I shut it down and make it stop? It's like, well, how do I use it and use the sensitivity to pressure? And she, you know, she's probably going to end up being like one of those perfectionist dogs that she is. Yeah. 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 And so the 12 poles is too much for her to do it perfectly. So she just shuts down. So it's like, all right, well then, you know, the pressure is like, how can I help her learn something in smaller doses so that she can deal with the perfectionist part? Got it. Yeah. 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 She is a perfectionist for sure. And so what her answer is, if I can't do it right, I don't want to do it. Yes, that's right. Yeah. That's, yep. that's so kind of set her up thinks. to be able to do it well in smaller doses and learning like, okay, you can do it. And it's just taking it in steps. She wants to yeah. do it well all at once immediately. Like, you know, and it's a very <laughs> female mammal trait. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. You'll see it okay. a lot more with the female animals, the mares with the horses and the female dogs way more. You'll see that trait. Interesting. What other a, things, whether, oh yeah. God. well, it's a huge source of, of, a very powerful leadership. It's just, it's, you know, not getting a handle on oneself and then can lead to kind of a crisis of self. If, you know, like she's, she needs some space to develop that in herself and realize that she's hard on herself essentially. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So we want to put her in situations where she doesn't have to be, and she can actually start to feel like she's coming into herself and doing thing, little things successfully. And it'll go a long way. Like it, it'll go fast too. If you can switch gears and just start thinking about it like that, she'll start to feel on top of the world. I love this. I think I'm going to listen to this section over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> I have the opposite. I have a female puppy because I had a litter last year. Ooh, and okay. I, I had the mom and dad and my experiment was what if I have the litter of puppies and I don't interfere, what's the role that the dad plays in raising the litter. And so I, Ooh, interesting. and how long can I keep them together before all hell breaks loose? And like, what happens if I don't intervene with weaning or anything? I just let them raise the puppies. And so that's a whole other episode, but, um, I, the puppy that I ended up with, which is a whole other story, the one that I ended up with because my daughter picked the puppy. And I see. I thought I was going to keep two and my daughter okay. picked one and I picked one. And I was like, there's no way I can raise two puppies properly. Two puppies, right? yeah, yeah. And, and I know better. And so I, I'm like, and I can't take away my daughter's puppy. So I ended up with her pick of the litter. And so I mine. see. And she Got was it. right. She picked the best puppy. I was ah. wrong. I didn't pick the right puppy for us. Ah, and, funny. But this puppy, it's the opposite with the confidence issue. She almost has too much. Interesting. She's larger. Than, yeah. She's like large and in charge. And I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and do you think that is because of how you raised them or your great experiment or no? You just think that's yeah. how she was going to be. She, I think it's how it's her temperament. Yeah. But I also think it's how she was raised. And it's the parents she has. It's all, it's all the factors. So is but... she in charge now in the house, even though she's no, a baby? No, I'm in charge. No. <laughs> no. But is she in charge of the, of the, the pack? pack? 
no, I'm not letting her. No. Okay. No, she will eventually rise yeah. to leadership, but she's not ready. So yeah, I have to really, she, she would be a very dangerous puppy <laughs> in the wrong hands. Cause she's like, yeah, I mean, I, I cannot believe some of the stuff that she does. I'm like, where is this even coming from? She's like, I got this. I'm like, you don't. <laughs> you don't got this. Yeah. But you'll see kids like that. And it's beautiful. Yes. And I don't want to squash right. it. But it's like, right. I don't want to kill the confidence. But I also like, you need to check yourself. You have a lot to learn and right. about being a benevolent leader. You are not a tyrant. You don't get to rule the world. You are not in charge of she's really, she's, it would be very unsafe for her. So. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I just, I just lost my benevolent leader. And so I have two now and I, it, I know, thank you. And I know that, um, the, my one w- thinks she could be, but then also at some level knows, I don't really want that responsibility. Yeah, right. <laughs> and then the boy is the younger. I mean, there's, they're, they're both mature, but the boy is a little bit younger and he's going to end up he like doesn't want it, but he knows it's his, you know, kind of thing. And yeah. so it's an interesting dynamic and I'm on puppy lists as many of us have to do that. And, uh, it'll be interesting to see what energy comes in. If that's the energy, the leader, the future leader, right. You know, because these two are kind of like, I mean, do you want it? I don't really want it. Yeah. Do you want it? I don't. Uh, okay. Well, fine. Well, that's what this puppy is like, wants to take over leading her parents. And actually mm-hmm. she's got more leadership. She, she has more boldness and confidence than both of them. Interesting. But not the yeah. benevolence. And so <laughs> you don't get to have the boldness without the benevolence. It's not safe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting too, the different styles I think that dogs have in leadership positions, right? My, the one, the girl that I just lost was so quiet that you didn't really even like see her signals barely. Yeah. Like you, but I would take her to new places or new packs or were like to a friend's house where they had dogs. And all of a sudden you just saw them shift around her. Yeah. And she didn't do anything. She was like girl next door, sweet, you know, from a human perspective, like you could barely see anything quote happen, but all of a sudden that you could, you could, what you could see was the other dog's response to her. This just goes back to what is it that we're supposed to do? And what is it that she offered, which was a state of ease and taking care of herself and her own nervous system so that others could relax around her. So she was aware and calm and that felt good to be around. Yeah. And so she, it's not that she wasn't doing anything. It's that she was doing everything. Right. Yeah. Everything that matters. Yeah. 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 Interesting. It's very hard to lose those presences in our lives because whether they're human or horse or dog or cat or whatever it is, because they, they offer us a place to just be as well. Yeah. Yeah. True. And yeah, you know, there's, I have my 15 year old border collie is, you know, really aging. And he was that he's been that for me his whole life. And he doesn't, he has some dementia, so he's not, he doesn't have as much ease as he used to. He's agitated right. and it's like, oh. I've lost that. And yeah, that presence that he offered, he yeah. doesn't have it anymore. And it's, it's, Oof. you can feel it. Yeah. That's, really that's late. hard. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So that we don't both end up crying or at least me. I know. Um, so, um, what, since you have been in competitive environments before, um, what is a couple things that you wish you could tell people <laughs> that you see? Cause I know that you've observed things and you've been like, Oh, Oh my, I could fix that. Or I've got a, there's, I could help you with that. You know, like, is there yeah. some things that you wish we all knew? <laughs> well, it's really interesting in the sheep herding world. You know, my trainer really likes to switch the dogs to training on the whistle away from okay. voice quickly because he says that there's, you can't really communicate our emotion through the whistle. Yeah. It's more that, honest, I guess. It's yeah. just clean communication. And yeah. I would say our emotional reactivity as humans and how much, like how dysregulated we are and we don't realize it and how much we're communicating that to our animals and to each other, you know, our like 
that frustration level or mm-hmm. pressure that we're putting on ourselves and how much we're putting that into the environment, I think is yeah. the, really the most important lesson here is like, what am I bringing? What am I putting out into the environment? And whether it's to my dog or to other handlers or to other dogs, or just to the like, system that we're in that day. And, you know, how is there a way for me to stay calm, alert, responsive without getting into reactivity and learning the difference where I can modulate that? Yeah. So I'm dealing with pressure and I'm keeping the pressure on, but I've not flooded the system. And what I see most of all is just humans flooding their flooding. own system. Yeah. Their dog system, yeah. the whole environment that, that, you know, that we're all sharing with with how they're acting, how they're communicating, right. but it's coming from within. Yeah. So I, I can hear like the response because it's, it's in my own mind too. I, you know, I tell people a lot, it's kind of like a puppy. We, if you, if you don't want them to take chew on the shoe, you take the shoe away, but you replace it because you can't just say, don't do something. You have to actually give them something to do. And it seems to be an analogy. Most of us understand. Yeah. So in that moment, when you're saying, don't be dysregulated. Don't be, you know, I don't want to be this person. I don't want to be overstressed. I don't want to flood. What is it that we should be doing? Is it literally just calming, soothing yeah. things? Like what, give us something to do. <laughs> well, I think that to start, like, how are we, do we even know what it's like when we are flooded? So first we have to get mm-hmm. to know our own reactivity mm-hmm. system to know what it feels like when we are Yeah. And then learning, like, what does it take for me to dial that back? And so if you were to go into a show environment and let's say you're like, I'm just going to work on this for a while. And so the results might be that I'm not going to do as well because I'm trying to figure this out. And so, um, but I'm going to learn, I'm going to focus on learning to take care of myself in this environment. And so what are the signs? What are my signs? Like, oh, all I, my neck gets prickly. I, my voice raises, my tone changes, my dog starts to act this way. So I'm going to look for those signs. And when those happen, you know, I start to practice things like I stop and take three deep breaths. You know, I like, I have like something in my pocket, like a stress ball or, okay. you know, yep. I have things that I've decided, like, well, how do I soothe myself? Or I have like a mantra I've created. That's like, you know, we're having fun Beth. Like this is, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm here to have fun or I have an accountability partner who, you know, I'm going to work on it with a coach around, you know, noticing when I've kind of flipped my lid and gone, I start to get flooded. Somebody's going to help me like dial it back. Hey, pause. All right. There it is. Like, we're just looking for where it's gone over, over energetically and over pressure. So I can dial it back a little bit. And so a commitment to work on that and get to know it goes a long way. It's just, awareness is a huge part of it. Cause as yeah. soon as you are aware, you're like, okay, what, I'm just going to ask myself and try to stay aware of what's happening within me for a while. And when I notice I've gotten triggered, I'm just going to dial it back and take some breaths, slow down, stop if I have to. And I'm going to practice doing that even when I'm training, because it happens when people are training. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's really helpful that you're saying that, right? Is that, okay, well, if this should happen, this is going to be my response. This is what I'm going to do. And to visualize it and plan plan for. Yeah. And practice that plan while you're training. I mean, I can be out in a training environment. There's no one there and it happens to me. There's no competition. Like I don't even compete anymore. So it's just me and my dogs. There's no agenda. There's no, like nothing matters. So why am I yelling? Like, right. 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 And why, yeah. why have I raised my voice? I have no idea why I have done that. Like, it, like nothing matters right now. Yeah. So, Interesting. But I, so practicing it in a place where you can work on that part of yourself. It's really ab- about, I'm going to stop training my dog. I'm going to train myself in a dog training environment. Mm, hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because honestly, and this is what I conversation I get into all the time, the skills, the dog skills are easy. That's literally the easiest part of it all. Absolutely. You've got these great talented animals. <laughs> they want to partner with us. It's, it's the human element that's. Yeah. 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 
Well, this has been phenomenal. I could talk all day, but we won't I do that know. to you. Thank, Thank you so oh, very much for this. This yes. is just a treat for us. And um, I will have the link in the show notes and all that good stuff. So everybody Wonderful. can go buy the book and hear more from you. So thank, thank you. you. I'm so happy much. to be back anytime. If you ever want to talk about dogs, it's one of my favorite <laughs> topics. So happy well, to we do will, so. We'll take you up on that. All thank right. You. All right. Thanks.